Uh, my name is Randy Spiewak. Uh, I retired from after 41 and a half years in higher ed, uh, predominantly in the Florida Community College system at three different community colleges. Uh, always on the business office side, I started as a young controller back in the uh, late, uh, early 1970s, and I retired as the exec, executive VP and CFO at Daytona State College. Used to be Daytona Beach Community College, Daytona Beach Junior College, go back its 50 year plus history. Um, but the last couple of years at, at Daytona State, before I retired in 2011, I wanted to take on one last big project, something that uh, had been bugging me for a long time and uh, was waiting for the, all the right uh, solutions to be uh, someday to be available to solve the problem. The problem was, and it's the same problem you all have almost in every school I've been to, um, your students can't afford books anymore, uh, too many of them. And as a business officer, I was purely looking at just cost. I wasn't getting involved in all of the things that take place in the, uh, to engage students in the classroom. And uh, I was looking purely at that thing we call a hardback textbook and that industry. And it's a broken industry. And, uh, and I'm not anti-publisher and I'm not anti-bookstores. I'm just pro-student. And our students can't afford it anymore. Uh, so I'm going to quickly take you through what we learned after two and a half years of, of trying to figure out how to solve this problem, failing at least a half a dozen times, and then finally coming up with a solution uh, that works. I've done uh, this presentation now at about 412 college and university campuses in 42 states in three and a half years. I'm never home. Uh, when you get a letter from uh, Dick Anders uh, Anderson at um, uh, from Delta saying, uh, you just hit a million miles in two years. <laughs> you know, you spent way too much time on an airplane. So, uh, I don't, I, the, the link's not seem uh, to work, but uh, this, a week ago Monday, uh, I was doing a similar presentation at the National Association of College and University Business Officers and uh, a mini keynote on um, Sunday. And Monday the morning, the keynote speaker was none other than Bill Gates. Uh, about 3,000 people there. And I got a front seat row, just snuck in early, and I did what I wasn't supposed to, and I videoed part of his, his uh, presentation. And because he was talking about higher ed, business officers, technology. And he jumped into e-text. What you won't see in that bottom right-hand corner is a video of him, and it's 44 seconds long, and he's, he's saying something like this. In five years, there'll be no hardback books. There's no way that the industry will support itself. Technology is going to replace it. As screens get larger, as the technology gets better, uh, it will become more and more adopted. I mean, if you look at the users of, of just the simple single functioning e-readers like the, the Kindle and the Nook and those kind of things, um, it's the, the, who, what age group is the predominant, predominant user of those kind of devices? They're not in this room except for up front here it's me. The, the 65 and older group, uh, we read, we have time, and we got money. So we, we've used these devices. Uh, we worry a lot in higher education about what we think problems are. Oh, students want a whole paper. Everybody agree? Wrong. Uh, students want to, uh, you know, the, we have all these beliefs and many of the misconceptions that we have to get over. We struggled with it for two and a half years, too, because we had the same and, uh, misbeliefs and misconceptions uh, as to what e-text technology was. I'll give you this. The technology really stunk until about mid-2010. Uh, mid uh, it was basically just a PDF file on a screen. You couldn't do much with it. Uh, it was less functional than a hardback. You can't take your highlighter and highlight the front of your screen. You can't take your pen and write notes across the front of your screen. The original software was pretty weak, and the industry was created initially to have the pub to give the publishers a media to send a faculty member a desk copy a preview rather than sending them a hardback even if they stamp it drill holes in it where does it end up guys in the used book industry sold to students so they don't buy a new one uh, so the the textbook industry the publishers uh, figured out well, we're beating ourselves to death so let's get out of that let's make it electronic let the faculty member use it and look at it and then it'll disappear, and we won't be trying to uh, sell our, our brand new books against books we've already sent out to faculty members to look at. 
and that's what happens. Um, I think that electronic text will probably be the most profound technology uh, in, obviously in my career, but maybe in your career that does two things. Not only will it improve uh, or, or reduce the cost to our students and increase access, because uh, uh, where I've been working with uh, institutions on electronic text, we're, we're getting to the point where we're soon to, to reach as, as much as a 95% reduction in the cost of a hardback for a fully interactive electronic text from any source, published, open educational resource, things that your faculty create, any combination thereof. The trick is knowing all the pieces and parts and how to do it. Um, it will not only reduce the cost, but it's going to improve what takes place in the classroom. What does your textbook do? How many of you are classroom teachers? Me too. I, I taught accounting every, at least one semester a year, even though I was the executive VP at the, at the college. And we were a small school of about 37,000 students. And I wanted to remember what it was like in the classroom every year, especially when we were working on budget. Because that's what it's all about, students, teachers. All the rest of us are just secondary. Um, what took place in the classroom when you can get a fully interactive electronic text and get students engaged, when you see those lights come on in their eyes, uh, that, when you can find out from their, their software what kind of notes they're taking, how much time they're spending reading, annotating, taking notes, can they share this information electronically amongst themselves? Can they ask questions of the faculty that they were embarrassed to ask in, cl in class and get a response back? privately or have a response sent out broadcasted to all the students because as an accounting instructor I knew I did a wonderful job teaching that uh, topic on double declining balance depreciation and 16 out of 20 students in the class said I'm stuck on this and I thought well what did I do wrong so I went back made sure that I broad broadcast a message out to the students saying we're going to recover this because it looks like I didn't do such a hot job teaching it uh, or maybe the book's not doing a very good job either, but take a look at this article. This, this is something that will help you. And I just brought, pushed it out because of the technology is available using cloud so that the student's book just got smarter that second. Something was added to it live as they were working. So we're going to talk about that too. Uh, what does the average textbook cost today? Undergrad, freshman, sophomore. 156. Somebody said 150. They were right on target. Uh, what about upper division? Just short of 200. What about graduate programs, professional like uh, engineering, uh, medicine, law? 300 plus. From 150 to 300 dollars for paper, cardboard, binding, and ink. Do you know what that thing costs to manufacture? I don't mean covering the cost of the publishers, overhead, administration, royalties, commissions to the reps that come to your offices. What did it cost to manufacture? It's almost all done in China, too. $4.76. Go look at the information out there. You'll find it like I did. How do you get from $4.76 to $156 or $196 or whatever it's going to be? What is in between? As a business officer, I was bound and determined to find out why. Because until we get rid of some of that stuff in between, uh, students aren't going to buy it. This is an absolute fact, and it'll be very similar to your school. Unless, unless anybody here from proprietary school, where when the student pays this very large tuition, they ship them books or they send them electro. In those cases, students didn't have a choice. They just received it. But when the students have a choice, whether to buy a book or not, out of 100 students, 50-plus students don't buy a book. It's a fact on your campus students, I won't say that's true because without fundamentals of nursing, you don't even start the program. But uh, in most cases, especially gen ed, half your students don't buy the book, can't afford it. They try to share. They wait till they get their next paycheck. When, when tuition and fees are exceeded by the cost of books, what is it, Houston, we got a problem. And that's what we had at the community college where I, work. I worked. Books were more expensive than tuition. That's not the case in all of higher education, obviously, and obviously not in private. Um, so we, out of these 100 students, more than 50 don't buy a book. And of the remaining 45 or so students, about 35 of those students prefer used books. They're about 75% of the cost of a new book. And many of them have 
somebody else's notes that may or may not be correct or somebody else's highlighting that may or may not be on target. But you take that risk because you want to spend a little less. So guess what's left? 12 to 15 books out of that 100 were sold new. How much money did the publisher make on the, on the 50 students that didn't buy books? How many much, much money did they and the, and the author royalties, how much did they make on the 35 students who bought used books? Zero. If you want to know why books are $156, look at the battle. Published, new versus everything else or nothing at all. That's a problem. It's not the publisher's fault. It's not the used book industry fault. It, it's called free enterprise. And it's what is, exists out there. So how do we find a way to solve it? That's a big problem. How much feedback do you get from that hardback book? Does it tell you all these wonderful things about Johnny's and Mary's study habits? What they have downloaded or what other materials they might have read in, in my day? Uh, we didn't download anything. Um, we didn't have downloading. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything, obviously. But an electronic text can give you tons of information and actually a lot of analytics so that a faculty member can look at what a student is doing and determine a lot of things. If I, I'll just give you a quick example. With good analytics, looking at effort versus result grades uh, versus amount of time spent reading, annotating, highlighting, etc., I, I want to look at the extremes. If I see, I just do a bar chart of every student in my class from the most time spent doing those three, th three simple things to the least time spent and overlay that with grades. Is there a correlation between effort and grade? You'd think there is, and there normally is, but there are exceptions. What about the kid that spent no time and got an A? Either really, really smart or cheated. Uh, one, something happened, and I'm going to look into it. What's more important to me is the student that spent a lot of time and failed. Is there a problem? Is there something that I'm not, I can do to help that student who's not doing well and spends a lot of time? Maybe they're not spending their time wisely. And good software will track what a student is doing, not just to open the system and turn the system off. Everybody here use an LMS at their institution? What does it tell you when you sign on, when you sign off? Not much in between. Question? Yeah. Yeah. You get a little bit, but it's basically turn on, turn off. It doesn't say what they're doing. And, and if we knew what students were doing and we could... If a student would allow it, wouldn't it be interesting if you're teaching a class and you could look at, at Johnny's notes? I could look at Johnny's notes in my accounting class and say, ooh, Johnny, send him a message. Debit doesn't mean plus and credit doesn't mean minus. It means left and right. I know it's confusing. I got a D my first semester in accounting too. Uh, stop by my office. Let's get this fixed. Instead of the first exam, Johnny taking it and failing. You've captured something that you couldn't do unless you gave an exam or asked a question. You wouldn't know that Johnny didn't understand the concept. I think the real positive of this wasn't the cost reduction, and the cost reduction is enormous when it's mature at an institution. I'll talk about that, but it's what takes place in the classroom. That's what we found after all of the piloting we did, after the failing we did. We actually started on Kindles, and that was a disaster. Wonderful for reading novels, terrible for textbook. I want to see you, uh, before the fire days, I want to see you type a term paper on your old Kindle. I want to see you do a, a, any a research on your Kindle. I want to see you answer emails and do anything. It was a single functioning device, which means you still had to have another device to do all the other things. We were looking for a simple answer. If, if we reduced the cost of books and made students buy a handful of devices, you saved nothing. So we wanted to have something that really did reduce cost to students. Okay, it will increase student retention, reduce dropout and withdrawal if students are more successful. What does that do to your pocketbook at an institution if, if half of our, our freshman class doesn't disappear in, in January? Ooh, it's called revenue. It's called full classes, and if I'm a teacher, it's called making a load. Uh, we want to have students be successful. So this is one thing that will help that. It doesn't solve everything. We still have to be good instructors. We still have to have good content and materials, but it does do something to help improve it. And what does it cost the institution? Nothing. All of the pieces and parts to do this is something that's borne by the student, but it becomes very immaterial if you do it the right way.
An e-text is not just a PDF file. When it was, it was terrible. Uh, what it is today, a fully interactive electronic text, uh, is digital content in any format, printed, audio, video, uh, all uh, on, on one common platform so that students don't have to, or students don't, can learn one way to navigate, and they navigate on every bit of the material you send them. Not only their textbook or textbooks in class, but articles, casework, PowerPoints, all of that. And if the tool set, if the software is good, the tool set will be, you'll be able to use that same tool set for doing searching and translating into other languages and highlighting and annotating, not only with the textbook, but with everything else. With an article you put in there, with some, a Word file that you stuck out there. Can you see all the possibilities with, uh, that if you put that all in one place? Someone ought to be able to say, well, I do that with my LMS. Sure you do. And what happens at the end of the semester with every LMS? All oh, that's gone. You can't get to the portal for that section anymore, can you? If you put it in, a, in, a, in the electronic text with, with some of the platforms, you put it in the text, and you get to the text by opening the, the LMS and not having to do a, a next, uh, a, another sign-on, just uh, clicking on an icon, and you're into your text and other materials. It, with really good digital rights management, the protection of the copyright from the providers of the content, the publishers and others. If you can pr protect them, they'll give you longer access. In some cases, access for as long as you're a student. Do uh, you think students want to print? Just give me an honest answer. No. Uh, students think they want to print. Students do print uh, the first time they try this. As students are starting to use more and more electronic text, guess what they're printing? Not the entire book. They're printing their notes and they're highlighting because that's what you're going to examine them on anyway. And if they didn't highlight it and didn't take notes, they'd probably understand the concept. So we're finding students are printing less and less and less when they can rely more and more on the, on the electronics. It doesn't eliminate it, but it sure does reduce it. Uh, we already talked about why books are expensive. Your, your college bookstores, whether you, your college university runs its own or whether it's contracted out to one of the fine companies that does that, the big boys being Follett, Barnes & Noble, Nebraska Books, Nebo, uh, those kind of companies. They're great companies, been around for many, many, many years. Um, they've done everything they can to reduce the cost, maximize access to used books. How many of you all have a rental book program? Why does it stink? especially if you, if you have to run it yourself, because the rental is basically 50% of the cost of a new book, and if you bought a new book and sold it back, at the end of the semester, you get 50% back. So what have you saved? Nothing. Uh, it's just you didn't have to put out all the dollars up front. And somebody's got to store those books, maintain all that stuff, and if you're running your own bookstore, it's a pain in the you-know-what. Ask the folks at University of Wisconsin Stout. Anybody here from Stout? Yeah and you're having to distribute those books, they pay a flat amount for the semester, guess who's getting out of the hardback business? Stout in a big way. They're, they're one of the leading schools in the nation converting to electronic text for two reasons. It's, it's, it kills them in time and effort, and guess what they see down the road? What, there won't be hardbacks to buy for their inventory of books. They'll be gone. So then what are they going to do? So they're already making that conversion. I do this, I go around and speak because as a colleague, uh, even though I'm retired, I don't want our institutions to be given a solution uh, or being told what to do. I want to put you in the driver's seat. You need to control what, the, what you're going to use for instructional materials and, and, and what format it goes to students and what it's going to cost them. It's our one chance, it's in your career, to make this happen because we've been going since 1439 the other way. What happened in 1439? Gutenberg. And since Gutenberg, authors, publishers, distributors like bookstores, they have been the ones that have controlled price, not schools. In most cases, I'm ashamed to admit that we don't really care what students pay. Faculty pick a book based on the content, and so it costs $300. That's the student's problem. Sometimes they do. Many times they don't. As a business officer, I had no idea how ridiculously expensive they were. But once I did, I want to try to find a way to solve it. 
we looked at all the functionality in the paper manual world, hardback world. What do students do? What do they bring to class? Books, notepads, uh, uh, paper, highlighters, uh, all the things they do. Most students have to have access to a, a PC of some kind to type up uh, uh, term papers and things. I mean, how many of your faculty allow handwritten papers to be turned in anymore? Not many. So you have to have all these access to hardware devices and all these manual things we do. Can you do this? in an electronic format, all of these things, much simpler and less costly for students, yes. And we tried to go through the committee I put together back in the summer of 2009. This was our first task, just to figure out what are we doing, or what are students doing, and what could students do, and is there a solution to all of those that makes sense, works, and is cost effective. We created an e-text committee, we met with the publishers, had private meetings with uh, the big three uh, and two of the uh, uh, specialized publishers. And they disclosed to us everything they were doing. We signed non-disclosure non uh, statements. And guess what? They're all doing the same thing. The publishers are prepared. They've been get, getting e-copyright ready for now over 15 years. They haven't printed textbooks using uh, typesetting since I had hair. They've been electronic for years. They just haven't passed that on to us, not because they didn't want to, because we didn't have the technology to accept it. We didn't have devices that you could read these on that could stay live for very long. What was battery life in 2009? On the best PC, three hours, maybe. Is that going to last you all day long? There's not enough sockets on the walls in here. If this was my class, for you all to plug in to keep charged. Can you imagine what the problems were we were just trying to figure out back in 2009? It was bad, just trying to figure out how to make this work. Then devices came out Christmas of 2009. The first one was a, a device called iPad. The first of the tablets and slates came out, and that started solving it. Longer battery life, lighter weight, not terribly uh, less expensive in the beginning, but less expensive over time. Netbooks came out, the solid state. Uh, uh, PCs, no moving parts, a little less expensive, a little less of, of a battery eater. Uh, we talked about devices, and I thought the device was the problem. If we can come up with a great device, uh, we can solve all of this. Not, the device was not the main problem. Neither was the, uh, the, the publishers. They were ready. The real problem was right there, uh, right there. E-reader platform software, the software that resides on whatever device you use that allows the student to do all of this, these th this functionality I was describing, to annotate, to search, to highlight, to uh, um, uh, share information, to translate, to uh, append information to it, to, be, uh, to create all these analytics. That was the key. The software up until that point was extremely proprietary. It was produced by two different organizations, publishers, bookstores. Was their primary goal to reduce cost to students? No, uh, their primary cost was to sell. Uh, I had, we had to go out and try to find somebody who was creating software whose primary goal was to provide students all kinds of functionality and, and be able to have students pay less money. The other thing that we tried to find were our universal solutions. How many of you are running five or six LMSs simultaneously? Why not? Let the students and faculty use whatever LMS they want to use. Somebody argue with me. Because you can't do it. You couldn't keep control of it. You're doing it with electronic text right now. You're letting your students buy them, and they do. They, either they skip your store, get it through your bookstore, or skip it and go to the, right, to the publisher or to Amazon or eBay. And the software that comes with that e-text to allow them to do things is different for every publisher, is different for every other so source of, uh, of, of uh, open educational resource provider. Yet we don't seem to do much about it. Can you imagine what it would be like if we had one common e-reader software platform that was used across the campus on any device with any content with any uh, LMS, because you're not going to be on the one you're on forever. They will change. You will change, more than likely. Uh, so we were looking for, in the beginning, we thought we would be in control. We'd distribute one device to every, all 37,000 students. We would have all the software. Our guys would write it, and it would be ours. We'd store all these electronic textbooks on our storage area network device. 
IT was having heart attacks. Uh, it was a we, 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 and where we ended up two and a half years later was any, any, any. When you can do something that let the students be in control and the faculty be in control, you win. When you try to control it, you can't. If you mandate it that students use it, you die. If you mandate that faculty use it, you'll fail. If you make it voluntary and you encourage students and faculty to use it, it grows like crazy. You mandate it, you kill it. Okay. Oh, we worried about things too back in those days like connectivity. Um, most e-books uh, e or e-text e-books, whatever you want to call them, are acquired two ways. Either you go online and you go out to some server or via the internet, most likely via some browser, any browser, and you get to your book. So it's, it's as long as you can get to the internet, you can get to your book. So that's an online version. Or you download it to your device, offline version. When you're offline, how much interactivity takes place? How much as far as communicating with other students takes place? Asking questions of the teacher. The teacher seeing the amount of effort that's taking place. None, none, none. But Johnny has that information with him all the time. Ooh, what happens if they have a, their hard drive crashes or they didn't have it backed up to a thumb drive and they lost their book and all their highlighting? Well, that's a problem with offline. Online has all the interactivity, has all the goodies, but when I go home, I don't have an internet service provider. Or I'm going to go camping, I won't be able to do homework on the weekend because I can't, if I can't get to uh, Starbucks or McDonald's or on campus, I'm SOL. A solution needed to have both. The primary place where the textbook e-text is maintained and all of the other materials that are aggregated with it should be online via the cloud technology, not your technology. Your campus is down from time to time. Whether it's maintenance or whether it's a power failure or whether it's a problem, there are down times. Can you imagine what it would be like the night before final exams and you can't get onto your network at, camp, uh, on col at the college or university and students can't get to their book and notes. I think all you know what would break loose. But if you use cloud technology from some of the major companies with just tons of redundancy, the only way you wouldn't be able to get your book if there's no electricity in the United States and nobody will give two flips about studying that night anyway. We'd have bigger problems. So use the best of the best when you're, you're thinking. So we need to find a solution that did both. Cover the student primarily when they're online. Give the student the ability to short term download the software and all of their content. Do stuff with it and when they go back online, have it automatically sync up. Update the online version. Send out the emails that, uh, and the questions that they had ready to go. Send out all the analytics that have been stored on their device and then just move on. Oh, sorry. We, um, 25 of us started on this committee. Uh, mostly faculty, about 55% were faculty who volunteered and I could, you picked out your innovative pioneer type faculty and I, we knew who they were. We had 600 full time faculty but you knew who the, the ones were that were the first ones that jumped into the LMS, the first ones that tried out this. Um, and I asked them to come join me on, on this. I didn't know whether it was going to be a dream or a nightmare but I, I sure wanted to try this. And they did, and they, we stuck together. Nobody dropped out of it, and it wasn't because I was the exec, because I asked, I told them, if you don't have the time, it's okay, you can back out. But uh, because they wanted to do it. We were about 44 strong when I retired, just as we were finishing up, coming up with our real solutions. And uh, we created a whole bunch of, of, uh, of subcommittees, bringing in other people to think, as we started realizing uh, problems, we would solve one and find three, solve one and find three. Uh, this is an, an order of priority. It's alphabetical, but do you think there's ADA concerns? American Disability Act. You better believe it. You better make sure that what you do serves your sight impaired, hearing impaired, physically impaired students. I can guarantee you the worst e-text serves it better than a hardback. The best ones may even be fully 508 uh, compliant, and there are a couple that are. When you get a letter of endorsement from the National Federation for the Blind, because they don't endorse nobody, uh, then you know you've done something right. When you can see a blind student on their e-text explaining to you what they're doing faster than you can see the changes on the screen, we got a solution. And I, it, it, there's, a, there's a YouTube out there with a student doing that quicker than a sighted student could keep up. But we looked at everything. 
we threw out some of these committees. I don't need a deployment committee when we're not going to deploy 37,000 devices. Why? Students already have them. How many of you think that half your students don't have a device? You're probably wrong. In the most rural community college or university I've been to, the numbers have been in excess of 70%, <clears throat> and in most cases, in excess of 90. Some type of device, a desktop, laptop, tablet, slate, iPad, smartphone. If you throw in smartphones, 100% of our students have them, and they get three a year. Now, it's not the best device to read, but students do. Uh, and sometimes they take the tablet or the small device to class, but their larger device is back at the, uh, at the uh, dorm or back at home uh, where they can do uh, power work. Okay, here's the opportunities I think you'll have. Uh, we can minimize that, that cost difference between the $4.76 and the $156, all the middlemen. We can eliminate quite a bit, if not all. We'll eliminate the textbook edition rate. When you teach, and there was a few of you that are faculty, do you love it when the new edition comes out? Why? Got to redo your notes. Got to set things up a little different. Wouldn't you like to use the same edition you're on? You've done, and, I mean, if you teach algebra since Pythagoras, how many times do we have to rewrite algebra books? What changes in them other than the questions in the back of the chapter? And maybe some different teaching techniques, maybe not. If we have a good book and we like it, you think publishers are going to sell us the seventh edition even though they're on the 14th edition? When it's electronic, you better believe it. It's cash. It's a sale. They don't care. They send a file and get out of the way. They don't have to do anything else. Their cost of running their business. Let's talk about the business model. I want to jump ahead before we run out of time. What drives the cost down on electronic text? Because if you go into your store and look at the price, it's 80, 90 percent of the cost of a hardback. Not saving much. And I, I was hoping somebody was going to yell at me and say, you don't save much, because you don't. Because it's coming from the original source, the publisher. But here's what will happen. If the publisher, here's the cost of running a publishing house. I've been told by publisher CFOs that the part of that cost of running their business that's associated with the production of the book, storing, paper, shipping, printing, on and on and on, um, and if you throw in the royal uh, to the, the commissions to the reps, and there's thousands of them that sell that book because they can only go to basically a campus at a, a day, sit with your department and maybe another department, and that's about it. When you're electronic, you can sit at your home and do it electronically and go to multiple states, multiple campuses. All I had on was a coat and tie, and I had, still had my skivvies on. They couldn't tell because I was just looking from the chest up. And, and handle business that way. So when their cost could reduce as much as 40%, 40 to 42% to uh, cost of running a publishing house. Right now they're selling what percent of the books? What did we say earlier? 12 to 15%. What if you guaranteed them every student would buy a book? You collected it registration like you do a lab fee for chemistry for glassware or frogs for biology. Um, and if it was a nominal amount, 15, 20, 25 dollars, not 150, not 200, not 300, but if it was a nominal amount, the, the bitchin' line would be really short if it existed at all. Another advantage is all students would come prepared. Does it bug you as a teacher when your students come without a textbook? You better believe it does. But if they're all prepared, actually they're prepared the minute they register if you allow them to get onto your LMS because the book's there before they ever started. Is just pushed out there as they register for a class. If the student decides to drop the class, they got refunded. They never went to the bookstore. They never got in line. How many of you know what bundling books are? When a, a textbook or a, a workbook, a, a, a DVD, a CD, a access code, shrink wrapped, sold for a million dollars, sold for a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars, and Johnny goes home with it and says, "I can't handle second semester of physics." I, I love the class, it's just too much. And he had opened that shrink wrap. Uh-oh, what happens? Bookstore says, sorry, Johnny, it's yours. Can't take it back. Even if Johnny didn't touch it the minute they opened it. In the electronic industry, electronic text, you still bundle materials in electronic form. How do you get refunded? Drop the course. It's only at the end of drop ad do you square up with the publisher because you'll know how many students 
paid for that book, are sitting in the seat, and they've made that commitment. At the end of Drop Ad, you get billed by the, either your software platform company or the publisher. You make transfer the funds, write the check, and it's all over. It's simpler than, it's, than, than you might think. We tried to make the process hard. It can be made very easy. When you take that cost and you reduce it, 30 40%, whatever it's going to be, and you increase volume of sales from 12 to 100, guess what the cost per unit is? Simple economics. Peanuts. I did an RFP, Request for Proposal, in July of 2010 to every publisher that we were using at Daytona State College. We had some 1,150 different titles. 17 of, of the publishers responded, which covered everything we did. The average price of the e-text they quoted us, and this is in the old days and it wasn't as sophisticated as now, was $37 and change back then. It ranged from 8 to 60. Just imagine what it would be like today if we consorted together, went out to the publishers and said, for these 6.5 million students, the potential of them buying an e-text, how low will you go? And we'll guarantee you 100% sell through if the faculty member elects to go electronic and if the student elects to take their class. It's an if or an if. It's not a mandate. And at some point in time, it will grow for two reasons. Student demand, because why should I take her accounting class or mine. She's electronic and her course is $80, $90 less expensive than mine, maybe more. We're both good teachers. She's made a load the first day of registration. I'm struggling because it costs more. The number one thing students will, are asked when they're surveyed as to why they prefer an electronic text, every college or university that's taken the, the surveys is cost. The number one thing for, stu for faculty is access to the book before or at least when class starts. And then there's a whole list of other things they like or dislike about it. Um, I think we can reduce the cost of textbooks by no less than 75%, less than a hardback. And I think it's going to be much greater than that. Does everybody know what OER is? Open Educational Resource. Basically free textbooks and materials that go with them. Uh, it's been a struggle to get institutions to start pursuing those. When they do, and, and they are, uh, when you start putting that into the mix and that cost is considerably less, now you mix some of that in and things that you generate. There are a number of institutions, especially for gen ed classes, that have created their own content. What the students get is what they've been sending to the print shop to print out and hand out and they use no book at all. I think it's Tidewater uh, Community College in Virginia. Go to their website, look right across the top, it says textbook free uh, uh, degree. If you take this degree, whatever the degree is that they're, they're promoting, you buy no books, period, none, nada. They provide the materials, and they've created them themselves. I think they used a company, um, Lumen Learning, to help them write all that content. Pretty neat stuff. And those can be available on the same platform as courses that the students are taking traditionally with other, uh, uh, that are, are uh, using traditional textbooks or other materials. You want one platform that all content will go on, not different one for everything. Um, it will increase access. How many of your students are part-time at your institution? A, a, a significant number? Ask them why. We did. We found out the majority of students that were part-time, it wasn't the old excuses, well, uh, I got a job and I can only take part-time classes. That's, you, you hear that. That's probably true. But the, the vast majority of the reason why students took less hours or why they dropped out or why they uh, withdrew from classes uh, was all dollar related. I could only afford to take six credit hours because the textbooks for, for taking 12, I didn't have the money. It was one or the other. I take less hours and buy books or I take more hours and buy no books. They didn't have a choice. When you make the books terribly expensive, they take more credit hours. What happens to your enrollment goes up. If you're funded based on enrollment, whether it's tuition or state appropriation, and those numbers get bigger, what happens? We get more dollars in our pocket. We get more dollars sometimes with the same head count. And, and students get done in a reasonable period of time. A two-year degree doesn't take four. A four-year degree doesn't take your university uh, student six. You get done in two or four, or closer anyway. So the business model, 100% sell through. There's a, how does the school uh, make money? You know, if you run your own store, it's the net income after you cover all your costs and you take all your revenue, list all your expense, and what's left is profit. 
We don't call it profit in higher ed. It's a nasty word. Surplus. Same thing. Uh, or you farm your bookstore out to one of the big companies and they pay you a commission. Guess who carries the weight of that commission on their shoulders? The 35 to 40 percent of students who buy books from your bookstore because 100 percent of students do not. Remember, 50% didn't buy them at all, and a chunk of them are going to eBay, Amazon, and other places, and skipping your store. When you go with a model, the 100% sell-through model, they don't go to the bookstore anymore. It's done automatically, but you can still collect revenue. If the content, the book, make up a number, it's $25. The software to do all these wonderful things, let's just make up a number, $7. Now, now we've got a $32 uh, uh, textbook. You add on a little bit more and keep it. I calculated at my institution that the total commission that I was getting from Follett, back then it was around a million six a year. If I divided that by the total potential number of students sitting in seats, had we completely converted, and we did not, uh, they were just work, starting to work on the, the conversion process when I retired. But it, if we had, it was about $1.17. $1.17 times X number of 100,000 butts in seats uh, was equivalent to the million six because you weren't running a bookstore anymore. What will the bookstores be? Because they don't go away. The word book just disappears. Over time, as hardback sales decline to the point where there aren't any more, if that's true, uh, what you're going to get involved in is other retail operations, which could be selling hardware, could be doing other things, or your bookstore could become a focal point at your institution for the aggregation of content in the electronic text with your faculty. Uh, they're the place where your faculty are sending the book orders now, so why not uh, retrain some of those bookstore folks to become part IT? Who gets paid more, IT guys or bookstore guys? IT guys, ooh. Then the bookstore uh, clerical folks start thinking, I may get a higher pay grade if I learn this new technology and I assist my faculty and students in using these technologies. There's a lot of winners if, out there if you think a little bit instead of worrying about it's going to go away. I've had too many bookstore managers turn this off because they see their jobs in peril. It's not the job, it's not their job they should be worried about, it's serving the student they should worry about, and their job will be protected someplace on campus if it's not right there. So they're not gonna go away. Uh, everything gets considerably easier as you start thinking of ways to put the in, uh, to implement uh, electronic text at your institution because you start eliminating lines, you eliminate, eliminating uh, the use of space that we is was tough enough for us to have enough of it anyway. Uh, what about federal financial aid? Covers it the same way textbooks are. What about devices? Sure, student can either buy a device with the cash that's left over after their tuition and fees are deducted, or if your bookstore sells devices, discounted, saving the student a lot, student just charges it there, just like, like nursing students get the stethoscope and their uniforms and everything else through the bookstore. It's perfectly okay with federal financial aid. It's a tool you need to have to get to the instructional content. Uh, sales volume, will already mentioned, will go from the low 40s, where it is now, to 100. And uh, bookstores can do all these things, training faculty. They will not go away. I just think you'll see the name is Campus Store or um, uh, Spirit Store. I just think the word bookstore will start to disappear. It has on many college campuses already. You want to have a solution, and I'll quit on this slide, I think, and ask questions. You want to have a solution that is very open, that covers any kind of content that works with any LMS, that allows faculty to do this when they're ready, allows students to do this when they're ready. You encourage it, you do it right, and then it will happen. All right, what questions can I answer? Because I've left out a lot of things. Yeah, a, a number of the, even the proprietary ones now are starting to gather some analytics. It, it depends on what kind of data they're capturing. Are they capturing just turn on, turn off time? Are they capturing what page you're on, time of day? Are they uh, capturing how many lines of annotation, how many characters? Uh, are, are they allowing the, the faculty member to physically sit at their screen and look at your notes or not? So. They all differ. There are some really good ones, and then there's some mediocre ones, and then some that don't have any analytics at all. But there's been such a demand for it, they're all working on it. 
uh, catch me after, because I, I try not to advertise for any company, but I'll, I'll tell you. I'll get you. Yep. They disappear. That's solved as well. The really good platforms that have strong digital rights management, DRMs, and protect uh, the publisher. For instance, when you print, you can have unlimited printing because here's what a page looks like. It has a barcode down the side uh, of, of the printed 8.5 by 11 page. Across the top, it says this page was printed for John Jones on this date, not for sale. It has a watermark built into it, it's, and, and the computer tracked that the student printed it. It says what they printed, how many pages they printed, and when they printed it. So if I see that a student has printed the entire book 17 times, I know it's not because they need 17 copies to carry around. And uh, when a student prints it 17 times now on a copy machine, <clears throat> do you know? Mm -mm. You don't know. And in this case, it doesn't matter where the student printed it, at home on their printer or on one of the devices at your campus. It's a software that controlled the hit the button to print. So when you start telling the publisher all these things you can do to protect them, they start worrying less about how long it's, it's kept alive. The best platforms are alive as long as the e-text e is available, as long as the student has access to your LMS. Because that's usually the vehicle you go through. You don't have to have the LMS use, actively using it. You, just gotta, you sign on to the LMS and go to the e-text, and your books are there. The, lesser, uh, the worst case is I've seen no more than it dies at the end of the semester, don't like that, or it dies in 180 days. If you want it forever, for what few books students want to keep forever. I know you say students would like to keep their books. How many of you have a box in your attic and it's full of dust? Uh, for that one, you just electronically print it to a PDF file or multiple PDF files and combine them. With Adobe tools, it's easy. And you keep it forever. It's just a print function, non-paper print. Yes, sir. Yes and yes. Uh, it's one of the ADA things that we really liked. Does everybody know what JAWS is? It's a tool for taking a, a textbook, but the electronic copy of it and creating Braille or uh, so that a, a sight-impaired student can read. When a sight-impaired student uh, needs to have a, a Braille copy, what does your bookstore have to do or your student disability services? They've got to contact the publisher to get a copy, electronic copy of the, of the text, and you have to convert it, right? Now we're two, three, four, five weeks into the semester and that poor student didn't have the book. When you're on an e-text, it's the same file. It was available before you started. The real good platforms have audio capability and video capability. But it won't be locked when it comes in E because it'll be turned over to the software platform company that, is, that you have selected, and what they have is a live PDF or EPUB 3 file, and we're moving more and more to EPUB 3 format rather than PDF format, which is really much more uh, easy to convert to, to audio. Good question. One more, and then I'm going to give a closing statement. Right. They, they, 17 of us on the administration all retired. The new president is there. It is not high on her list of, of uh, things to do. It will be, again. Some faculty are doing it on their own. But uh, you have my card. Contact me, and I can send you to dozens and dozens of colleges and universities that are way down the road for conversion. It breaks my heart that my own home institution isn't one of them, but those things happen. Uh, what I've been doing since I retired is one of the software companies that we found at the end of the process that had much of this capability was not created by a publisher, not created by a bookstore operator, but created at a university. Uh, I found them, they found me, and uh, they uh, they contract with me just to go out and speak uh, like a consultant. I'm not an employee. I never mention their name. They cover my travel. So I go to institutions at no cost. I talk and I never mention the name of the vendors. Uh, you'll find out what works best for you, but I'll give you all the, the hints, the guidelines as to how to approach this in a systematic way so that you take control of the cost of textbooks and, and um, 
You'll, this will be something that will be your decision, just like you picked an LMS. Somebody didn't tell you what to do. If you guys don't do something within five or so years, you won't have a choice. I know we, 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 we roll our eyes about the five years. Gates said it. The CEO of, of um, McGraw-Hill has said three years. When I started doing this four years ago, I was saying 10, so I wasn't too far off. Well, I appreciate it very much. Please contact me, email me if you're interested, and I'll be glad to come to your campus. Thank you. Thank you.